House of Ed Tech, Episode 92. Hey, I'm Miles, and you're listening to the House of Ed Tech with my daddy, Chris Nessie. Support for this episode of House of Ed Tech comes from Domain.com. It's easier than ever to add a custom domain to your web presence. You can grab a great .com or .net or whatever for as little as nine ninety nine per year and make it super easy to direct your readers or your viewers to your content. To grab the next great domain name, go to chrisnessy.com slash domains. Welcome to the House of Ed Tech podcast. I am your host, Chris Nessie. The House of Ed Tech explores how technology is changing the way teachers teach and the impact that technology is having in education. I discuss technology that is changing our classrooms and schools, and I share tools and tips that you can hear today and use tomorrow. You're going to hear the stories of teachers, leaders, and creators just like you. The purpose? Whether you use it or not, technology is changing the way you teach and how your students learn. And hello again. Welcome to this episode of the House of Ed Tech podcast. Coming up in this episode, the 92nd episode. Wow, we're only eight away from 100. There I go again, talking about episode 100. Anyway, coming up in this episode, we have our Ed Tech Thought, where we're going to take a look at what standard do you have to hold yourself to when you are interested and passionate about education or technology or really whatever. We have the EdTech recommendation, and I'm going to talk about a simple tool for curating your own podcast. And we have House of EdTech VIPs. Yes, that's plural. We have multiple people that I'm going to be shouting out that you need to connect with. And the featured content, well, she's sitting right across from me. She's back. America's favorite House of EdTech wife. (laughs) Welcome back to the podcast, Caitlin. Hello, everybody. How are you? I'm doing well. How's your summer? Uh, it's actually been a really great summer. I've really enjoyed this summer. The kids have been a lot of fun, perfect ages, getting out doing day, day trips. We went to D.C., had a good time. So, yeah, it's been a pretty good summer. Yes, and we're, and we're going to be talking about some other things that you're doing later in this episode. But I also want to say that, yes, this has been a really, really good summer. We, we've had fun on the trips. And- yeah, we've had a lot of got a lot of projects done. We've seen family quite a bit. We've had some adventures, but also had some good downtime and some good time being bored. I think boredom's important. I think boredom is key to recharging as an educator. Yeah, well, I even think for the kids. I think boredom's important because then they get a little bit more creative with their time and resources. Well, you figure now Miles has his new platform bed. That's yes. his loft bed, so he's got more space in his room to do activities. That's exciting for him. He's loved it the last couple of days. Yeah, I posted that to Instagram. I'll have that on my blog soon, katenessie.com. I'll probably also include a picture of it in the show notes for this episode at <laughs> chrisnessie.com slash 92. Yeah, it, uh, it looks really nice. It's worked out really well. So it's nice. They're both in big boy beds now. And one is an even bigger big boy bed. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, yeah. And, and Colton just had his his birthday. He's now two. Yeah, and he's already in a twin size bed, so he's a pretty big guy for his for his age. Not fat, but he's no, he's tall. He's very tall. He was he was getting close to about six inches from uh, top to bottom on his crib. Yeah, toddler mattress. So he was he he needed some room to cuddle in a bigger space. And, and we do the thing, Kate and I, where I measure them on their birthdays to see how tall they are on the inside of their bedroom doorways. And Colton, since last year, grew four and a quarter inches. Yeah, four inches. That's quite a bit. And quite a bit since January. So he's, yeah. uh, he's growing. Yeah, he's he's had quite a growth spurt because he went from, like, he kind of skipped through 2T rather quickly. And now he's he's comfortable in 3T. But we like to keep them in looser clothes anyway. I don't like to have them in sausage pants and shirts. <laughs> well, now you're just making it sound like it's your idea. I'm the one who originally wanted to well, put the Well, originally kids in. you wanted to give them adult <laughs> T-shirts and wait until they grew into them. And just let them grow into it, yes. That was a little too frugal for my nature. But we'll talk about that today, too. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, now... If you're new to the podcast, Caitlin has previously appeared 
and the episodes that she previously appeared on are episodes 14, 52, and 76, and you can get to all of those by going to chrisnessy.com slash, and put in those numbers, slash 14, slash 52, slash 76. And of those three episodes, the most popular one was episode 52, where it was called NCLB, and that was No Cash Left Behind, where Caitlin and I talked about our frugal lifestyle and how, as educators, we manage our finances and our approaches to a lot of the things that we do on a day-to-day basis, you know, raising a family and, and hitting on some of those more personal topics. So, of course, I'd love you to check out that episode. And some of that will come back through in this episode. But Caitlin is here for a specific reason, which we will get to shortly. But before we get to that part of the conversation, let us do the EdTech Thought. For this episode's EdTech Thought, I'm putting out the question, and Kate's right here with me. The basic question is, do you have to know everything? And I want to apply that question specifically to, do you have to know everything as somebody who's interested in technology as an ed tech person, you know, like myself? So recently on Twitter, and again, I'm just using this as the example. I'm not calling anybody out and saying they did anything wrong. I'm just pulling in what somebody said and using it to share my thoughts on the topic. So recently on Twitter, Mary Fran Demain, and her Twitter handle is a book for Francis, recently tweeted, quote, as an ed tech person, are you really expected to know about everything tech related? And she tagged some people in that tweet. I wasn't one of them, but it's on Twitter. It's public. And I commented on it. And my comment was, quote, I hold myself to a very high standard. I don't have to know as much as I do. I want to. I take pride in what I know and my desire to help. The key to my approach is that I want to learn as much as possible. I'm a lifelong learner. In my role as a high school social studies teacher, I'm not expected to know much about technology. Teachers in my position are expected to use technology effectively in their instruction. But I want more than that. Yes, I teach social studies, but I have other professional goals. So whether it's personal or professional, I want to learn as much as possible. Kate, you had some thoughts before we hit record. Can you weigh in on this? Sure. Um, Reading the comment, um, I kind of took it in a different way as maybe somebody who might be interested in becoming an ed tech person and wondering if they need to know everything before they can call themselves an ed tech person. I kind of equate it to running. If you go out and run once, you're a runner. Um, Sometimes you don't have to know everything about a topic to start to build a tribe and a base and and be someone as a go-to resource in that that field. I think with ed tech, I definitely don't know everything about ed tech, but I have an interest in it and a passion for it as a means to an end to help my staff and my administrators and my students and help everybody as a resource. So for me, I think in ed tech... You know, to be an ed tech person, you definitely have to have an idea or a desire or an interest to keep learning about it and keep going with it. Um, and that's how you build yourself as an ed tech person. You're somebody that, hey, I can go ask this person the question. They may have never used this software before, may have never even heard of it, but I know they're now going to go investigate it and come back to me with maybe things that I didn't notice or that I was too afraid to click buttons on and learn about. There's a lot of times people come to me. I never really used Google Classroom in the last few years. Um, When it first came out in beta, I used it a little bit here and there, but I never, you know, clearly I don't, as a librarian, have direct classes where I'm going to do lessons and do it the same way as teachers would. But last year I did professional development using Google Classroom so that I could learn it. So now I have teachers who come to me and say, hey, how do I do this? How do I do that? And I now know. So for me... They look at me as a resource because not only did I go above and beyond and learn something that I then can turn around and teach them, but I'm not afraid to go out there and and say, hey, you know what? I don't know how to use it, but I'm going to figure out how to use it right alongside of you and let's do it together. So it's kind of, I think to be an ed tech person, you just have to have a passion and an interest and really keep always learning, constantly be a lifelong learner with education technology or whatever the thing you want to be that person of whatever topic area or interest, 
sharing that passion and being that resource to other people and people knowing they can always come to you with a question and they'll get an answer, whether it's in that five minutes or they know you're going to work on it and come back to them. Well, then I think my problem with it is, I don't know if it's my problem, but then the way I'm looking at it as I'm personally, I know a lot. I want to learn a lot. And I guess my issue is I see a lot of people who are running around as quote unquote ed tech people who don't know as much as I do. And I'm not in one of those ed tech positions. So I think that's part of my frustration. Well, and like I always say to you, when we talk about anything or any professional desires, desires and things like that, you don't necessarily have to be employed in that position to be a tribe leader and be somebody who is, you know, leading others and teaching others and being a resource for others. There are many librarians I know that are hands off with technology and they'll even admit it. But then, you know, they might go out and be like, oh, yes, I do technology or like want to get like a side job doing technology stuff or consulting or whatever else. But they're not like into technology. And I just look at it this way. I focus on myself. I focus on what I can do and what I can help people with. And I don't look to my I guess, you know, I enjoy my day job, but I don't look to my day job to fulfill all of my passions and desires. You have such an ed tech desire so what if you're not in that job to do it professionally? Well, that's what this get... podcast does for me. <laughs> I know. That's what I mean. Like, like uh, that's where I always go. Just, you don't, so what if there's other people doing it and being called that? I can call myself anything on the internet. I can promote myself as anything on the internet. And hell, I usually do promote myself as a variety of things on the internet. And it doesn't matter. Really what it comes down to and what I think of is if you're a genuine person and you're interested in learning and teaching others... And you have those desires and interests and knowledge and wherewithal, then you are an ed tech person. So then you don't know, you don't have to know everything, but whether it's ed tech or anything you're interested in, you need to have that desire to continue to acquire knowledge. Absolutely. And I think you have to keep building upon prior knowledge. I mean, going back to running, sure, you're a runner, but your first day you might be wearing a cotton t-shirt, like some old sneakers, like... Sure, you can tell the guy down the street about running who's never run before, like, hey, this is what I do and this is what I've learned. But now being a runner for 15 years, I can go and say, this shoe works best for this, barefoot running this. This is my experience. I have 15 years of experience doing it and being passionate about it and interested in it. So I can share, hey, when you're doing a half marathon, here are some suggestions, here are some tips. Whereas back when I barely ran a 5K, I could help the next guy get started But there's always, you know, different levels to reach and different information to then go with. And with technology, I mean, it changes. Technology is changing every day. And to be able to be aware of what's going on out in the world and bring those things in, which I think is great what you do with the podcast and share that with other people. I think that's how you build yourself as an ed tech person. You didn't start out the first day of your podcast being a world leader in education technology. You've been doing this for years. You've been talking to people for hours upon hours. You've been going to conferences. You've been building your knowledge. So, yeah, does an ed tech person have to know everything about tech related things? I wouldn't say everything, but I definitely think it's a skill and something that you need to build over time. And you're not going to start out right off the bat being an ed tech guru on your first day. You know, you run a marathon, you're not going to go out your first day and run a marathon. You're going to go out and run down the block and see how you do. There you (laughs) go. And you build that base. So I do think some people expect you to know everything. And that's where the learning part and the resource part comes in because everyone assumes I know everything when they come into my library. And then I'm honest with people. I don't pretend to know everything. But I say, hey, let me look into that and I will get back to you. And usually before the end of the day, they've got an email, they've got a resource, they've got a time set up with me to go over something because I've now taken the time to learn it and and help them when they didn't have that extra time to spend. I guess to close this part, I I will go with, because this has actually been a little bit of a a self-help session for me, so thank you. (laughs) Um, I I, I will finish. Yeah, we didn't talk about this prior. (laughs) We didn't talk about this prior. So I, I will then finish with that I will just continue to lay claim to my willingness to continue growing and learning and retaining as much as possible so that I can continue to help myself. And if I continue to grow, then I can continue to help you and you who's listening. You can continue to consider me 
a reputable source of information. That's my EdTech thought. And now it's time for this episode's EdTech recommendation. And I'm very honored and excited to have a guest once again to talk about something that they created and something that I believe you will find valuable, especially if you are a fan of podcasting. And since you're listening to the House of Ed Tech, you are interested in podcasts and listening. But we're going to talk about something today that can help get you started with creating. Uh, and all creation, I think, starts with curation. So today we're going to be talking with Uzer Bande Ali, and he is the founder and creator of Podcast Jockey, which you can find at podcastjockey.com. Welcome to the House of Ed Tech, Uzer. Hi, thanks so much. I'm, I'm so excited about being here. I, I am so excited that I found Podcast Jockey through a Voxer group that I'm in, as we talked about yep. previously. Uh, and, and I wanted to bring you on the podcast because it's another opportunity that we've now connected and I can bring you right on here to talk directly with my listeners about what you've created and how they can find value in it. So let's start with first, what is Podcast Jockey? Yeah, uh, Podcast Jockey <clears throat> is a good way for somebody to get their feet wet who's, who's looking to start a podcast. Uh, they can curate a p podcast playlist of their favorite episodes that they have listened to. They want to recommend it to somebody else uh, and they can get their uh, podcast feed uh, the resulting feed, they can publish it to iTunes or use the podcast uh, listener page to share it with their friends and followers, or even use a widget that they can embed on their own website uh, or any other blog that they might be interested in sharing it with. Yeah, Azur, the, the technology is really, really awesome. It, it's really easy to use. And the different features that you just mentioned are the reasons that attracted me to use Podcast Jockey for the Education Podcast Network. Uh, you've recently added what you just mentioned in the the widget embed so you could put a player so for the teacher who's got a website or a blog they can be curating this podcast content embed the player share it with students the the page that you create and i'm looking at the education podcast network one right now it's really easy it'll play the episodes that you've selected well, what else can you share with us about you know maybe how you came up with this and and your background and how you came to this yeah, but before I jump into that, I just want to emphasize, I remember when you signed up for Podcast Jockey, I think you had a feed in the first three minutes when you logged in uh, from, from the moment you signed in and, you know, you were publishing. Uh, is that is that right when you started? Oh, yeah. I mean, based on my no fear policy, I, I heard about it, signed up for it. And again, I, I guess within three to five minutes, I had a podcast feed. I was already curating the podcast on the network, I think within 48 hours, and I'm going to say probably less. I submitted that RSS feed that you guys generate, and I submitted it to iTunes, and there's now a master feed for the Education Podcast Network that people can find in iTunes. That's awesome. Yeah, so within 48 hours of discovery, you are already on iTunes. That's great. Um, so if I could, you know, to answer your previous question, um, I volunteer with a lot of uh, youth development organizations in Atlanta, where I live, and um, I found that a lot of my mentorship, long distance mentorship, especially was becoming sharing podcasts with some of my mentees to say, hey, why don't you go check this episode out on TED Talks or uh, uh, Radio Lab or some other Snap Judgment podcast. Um, and what I found was uh, the youth uh, were really engaged with podcast listening. And then I did some more research to find that the market research said podcast listenership has been growing over the years. Uh, it's a great form of passive engagement. And I decided that um, instead of making a full-fledged podcast, which I wasn't, which I wasn't ready for, uh, <clears throat> I, I decided why not just curate uh, these podcast episodes that I want to share with my followers and my mentees um, and then just blast that out to them so that they can follow along and, and keep engaged with me and, and with the good content that I want them to listen to. Uh, over time, I found that more and more people wanted to have something like this. So I, there's a few organizations that uh, locally in Atlanta, we're really interested in this. So I decided to build the product myself. Uh, and now I've got you and, and several other organizations that are really passionate about this and are finding good value in um, curating a playlist and quickly sharing it out with the with their followers. Um, I'm also a part of a podcast group for New York Times. And they have a recommendation day every Sunday, they, they recommend podcast episodes to each other. And then they just package it all in a podcast jockey playlist. And then, the, you know, for the rest of the week, everybody's listening to that playlist. Uh, so it's a great way of 
uh, within communities, within smaller groups that are passionate about something to uh, put together a recommended list and for everybody to listen and benefit from it. One of the other features that I like that that you didn't hit on, and it's okay that you're the founder and didn't hit on it, but <laughs> I mean, the sign up is really easy. You can either sign up with email or, I mean, I, I use my Twitter and, and that made it you know super easy. And what I really appreciated is once we got connected and we spoke for the first time just a few days ago, yeah. and I was able to bring you some of my questions and I don't, concerns might not be the right word, but some, I guess, requests, and you've been able to implement them and make the service even better, even after just a couple of days. So I guess that means you're accessible and people can, you know, reach out to you and ask you questions and oh, oh, definitely support them. <laughs> yeah, for sure. You know, it's uh, one thing I've learned uh, in, in my career over time is you can't just build something V1 and expect everybody to, uh, you know, it, for it to fit everybody's needs and desires. You always have to keep evolving and responding. And if somebody like you has put their trust in the product and put your reputation at stake by using Podcast Jockey, and if you run into issues, there, you know, I'm not going to sit around and uh, wait for it to be become a bigger problem. It's important for me to react to uh, concerns, questions, uh, feature requests. So that's always a priority for me, very much. And, and I know as teachers, we appreciate that. We provide that support for our students. And obviously, being a connected educator, we provide that to the education community at large. Now, the next thing I wanted to hit on was, since you are an entrepreneur, tech-minded, uh, with Podcast Jockey, and we're here in the summer of 2017, where would you like to see Podcast Jockey go in the next you know, few months, the end of the year? What do you, what do you see down the pipeline? So I'm headed to Anaheim for podcast movement in the next month. Uh, the idea is to take it and shop it around with uh, a bunch of the attendees, uh, try to get some more people excited and, and um, uh, passionate about the idea and get, get more podcast playlists on the, ro- on, the, on the product. So in the short term, the idea is to uh, get more people excited, get more people to build their playlist and get more listeners to listen to the playlist. Uh, so that's the short term goal. In the longer term, uh, there are some avenues that we're exploring in building features that are maybe behind a paywall. Podcast Jockey Basic will always be uh, free, but uh, Podcast Jockey Premium members might, might might be able to get some additional features that might be behind a paywall. Uh, maybe something like uh, specific analytics. Uh, we're still exploring the paywall features, but basic, uh, you know, uh, free podcast jockey will will always have the features we talked about that's fantastic and I, i'm people who listen to the show right now they know that my favorite four letter f word is free so <laughs> uh, and, and you can use that if you want to <laughs> yeah yeah i'm definitely going to be stealing that that line in the future <laughs> well Uzzer, it was fantastic to have you give me a few minutes of your time i know you're busy staying cool in hot lana as we said <laughs> um but for people you know, to the listener, if you have questions, you can immediately come to me as someone who is currently using Podcast Jockey, and I'll be happy to answer your questions and help you get started. Um, if, if I can't answer it, I'm going to send you to Uzzer, and, and he'll be able to obviously help you as the, the brains behind the whole thing. And what are the best ways that people can get in touch with you? Yeah, definitely. So you can find us on hi at podcastjockey.com. Uh, there's also the website, podcastjockey.com. Uh, if you're looking for an example of how the widget looks like on our homepage. Uh, Chris, your, your podcast network is featured there. So uh, an example of the widget and how it looks and what it does is visible on, on our homepage. And if you click on the view all link on the widget, you'll be able to see the, the page that we generate for listeners for every podcast on Podcast Jockey. So all the demos are on our, our homepage. But if you have any questions, uh, hit us up at hi at podcastjockey.com. Awesome. And of course, I will include... Uh, the link to the Education Podcast Network website, and you can see it live in the wild because I'm sure by the time I air this segment, I will have it implemented on the Education Podcast Network website. So you can definitely check it out there. And I'll also include a link to the EPN Podcast Jockey page so you guys can check it out, get in touch with Uzzer, get in touch with me. And hopefully as the new school year gets ready to kick off, you can add podcasts to your classroom. Uzzer, thank you so much for a few minutes. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, and I'm looking forward to engaging with your audience. Thanks. So I hope you check out Podcast Jockey, and if you do, let me know what type of podcasts you're curating. 
that's my EdTech recommendation. And now it's time for our featured content and our main conversation. And the theme, as you can tell by the title of this episode, is lifelong learning. And we touched on that really in the House of EdTech thought. And I guess if you check out something like Podcast Jockey, which allows you to curate podcasts and have a podcast without having to create one, you can use obviously podcasting as a lifelong learning tool to continue to grow professionally and personally. And we know that from you listening to this show. And if you're into education, anything else on the education podcast network. But obviously, we all know that podcasts can be used to continue to learn anything we want to learn. And with that, I am proud to say to you, my House of EdTech audience, that I am not the only Nessie sitting in this studio who has <laughs> a podcast. Caitlin, you are a podcaster now. Talk about this. I am a podcaster now. I'm an official podcaster. So I started the Lifelong Learning Podcast last week to uh, the first episode is just a little intro, but I just released my second episode. If you're listening to this, it's August 18th. So I re released a second episode to listen to about our frugal experience. The Lifelong Learning Podcast has been at least a year or more in the making uh, since you started your podcast, you've wanted me to podcast. And I've been very like, no, I'm enjoying listening to podcasts. I'm okay. And then being on your show a few times, I was like, oh, this is kind of fun. Maybe I'll, I'll be interested. So last summer, we were trying to put together some podcast ideas. And I didn't really want to commit to any sort of specific subject area or any kind of, I don't do well with pigeonholing myself. There's so many different things that I'm interested in as a librarian. I'm constantly learning new things. So I didn't want to be the frugal podcaster or the food person or the runner or, you know, the librarian. I didn't want to like, we kept going back around and around and around and you were like, we'll just do this. And so I finally, this summer, it finally hit me and I was like, all I ever tell people is that I'm a lifelong learner and I want to keep learning and learning doesn't stop after formal schooling. And you can learn pretty much anything you want these days, especially with, you know, YouTube videos and blogs. You know, a lot of things that I learned were prior to all of these things available. But now that there's so much available, I feel like all we do all day is learn things. We are like, wait, I've never used before. I've never done this. I would, you know, there's something. Let me Google it. Let me watch a video. Let me learn how to do it. So I finally put together Lifelong Learning Podcast. I found that there was nobody else out there with the same exact podcast um, with the same ideas and, and stuff like that. So I didn't want to like step on somebody else's toes and go with a podcast that had a similar name or anything. But so I started this podcast and basically I'm excited to share uh, what will start out being things that I've already learned about or are perfecting or failed with. And then over time, it'll start to become presently what I'm learning about or new things that I'm doing. Uh, there's so much, so many things I want to learn and so many things I have learned that I am excited to share that with others and hopefully inspire you. If you come join me on the lifelong learning podcast, hopefully inspire you to come and learn about all sorts of topics and all sorts of different things that I'm learning about and maybe inspire you to get excited to learn about things that you've always wanted to learn to do. So a couple of things that pop to my head while, while you're sharing and, and I, you know, I'm very excited for you. I know us. you're so excited for me. So I think that's why you built the office the way it is and microphones and both desks and everything else. You were planning for it. Yes. But so the first thing I want to do is throw myself in front of the bus. And the reason this pot, one of the reasons, and it's a major factor, I'll be honest, is I got really excited for you to podcast a year ago and I threw so much at you yes. in terms of how to podcast. Here's what you need to do. You need artwork and titles and this and that. And I, yeah. I'm publicly, I'm publicly go, <laughs> easy for me to say, I'm publicly going to apologize for being way too excited and making it overwhelming. Oh yeah. Last summer I was like, oh, I just want to talk to a microphone, something simple, no big deal. Just kind of do it, you know, low and, and easy and, 
And he basically went into, you need to buy a domain name and you need to have this and you have to use this software and this plugin and this editing and this, you know, pick your song. I mean, I think we sat here one night for like three hours trying to pick like an intro song. And then like this go around, I was like, this one sounds fine. Let's just do that. And you left me alone <laughs> because you were like, wait, but that, but that, but that. And, you know, so thank you for your apology. I appreciate it. But yeah, so I might have started this a year ago. If but not for it was, me. It was too much, too much, too soon, too many things to think about. I have between my blog, I was at the time I was shutting down my photography business and, and winding that down. The kids were getting older you know, I was doing a lot of renovations in my library and everything. So it was a lot at once that I was like, whoa, I, I don't want my my mental juice all sucked up on little tweaks and things here and there. I just want to be able to talk to people and share what I'm learning. So we finally came to that conclusion this summer where I said, I'm ready to do it. I've listened to podcasters where they don't have all of these crazy things going on. They just talk into a microphone when they're like out. You know, one of the podcasters I listen to talks to her phone while she's out on a walk, and that's her podcast. Um, so for me, I want to focus on just great content and not worrying about everything else, all the little stuff. That stuff will come in time. I'll learn how to do all of that, and that'll be part of my lifelong learning is how to do a podcast and share all of that and slowly grow. I'm just giddy with excitement because you have a podcast. Oh, my God. You're like just totally sitting there. Well, I, was, I was so excited to, you know make the artwork and we went through some some versions of yeah the podcast i cover still don't art. like the artwork but it can change nothing is <laughs> luckily it can change. Art. he picked the picture i don't like the picture but you know when you i didn't want to have to think about it i didn't want to have to do it i just was like let me just start a podcast so now i'm excited about it because the first episode just getting that done was fine because that was just an intro and then i was like oh my gosh oh my gosh what am i gonna do and then like within a few days it was like <gasps> I have an idea and let me kind of lay the base and the foundation. We're very frugal and that's kind of what we do. I wouldn't say we're extremely frugal by any means. We definitely spend like regular people, but um, our focus is on frugal living. So the first full episode is on that experience and kind of our ups and downs and getting to that point. So now I'm excited. I didn't even think I'd release that first episode as quickly thereafter and I already have the third episode ready to record. So I'm kind of like, oh my gosh. But I don't know how often I'll release it. I can't say that it'll be out every week or every other week. I don't want to commit. Again, I didn't want to go crazy. So I don't want to commit to every single week. I know you sometimes stress out and you have a, your podcast coming out and you have a lot of things going on in the week or two. So for right now, it may be out a few times and then it may be quiet for a little while as the school year starts. I just kind of have to see where I'm at. But once I can learn the start to finish of recording and putting it in, editing it, and getting it all done, then it'll probably come out more often because then as things spark my interest or I, you know, work on show notes or whatever else and um, add a little bit more to it, and plus I'm learning constantly, so it'll be so easy to come up with topics. <laughs> but well, and, and some of the things that we've looked at already and you creating this show is, you know, the first episode, I sat down, I edited it, I showed it to you, and then we came up with... E each episode I'm learning more pieces to the puzzle right. since we, we, you we set me the up first with episode one way. Yeah. This episode two that just came out as we were. Yeah. I this. just learned how to publish it the way I want to publish it. What would work for my workflow. And I think that's so. important as you learn, find what works for you. So I I'm, I'm throwing not as crazy as I was last year, <sighs> but I'm presenting you with options a, B and C, and you're going to find what works for you ultimately. Yeah, over time, definitely. And that's, you know, even the first episode, I was trying to understand your process, which isn't how I would organize things or my thinking. So the second episode, I was able to have more of a hand in it. And then, you know, the next step, I just want to learn how to edit it or maybe make less mistakes while I'm talking. And therefore, I won't have to edit so much. And I can just send it on its merry way. So, but yeah, it's it's fun. It's It's a little weird sitting in a room alone talking to myself, but really to you. And well, it's much easier to sit here and have a conversation and talk to you. Yeah. But I don't want you on my podcast all the time. So no, I don't want to be on your podcast <laughs> all the time. I, now, to be fair, no, you'll be on there. I'm sure quite a bit for various I, things, but I would gladly have you on my podcast all the time. But again, we got two little, we got a yeah, we have, running it's, around. it's a lot of uh, scheduling and stuff, but we but definitely get a lot of things to, done. to go back to something you said before where you talked about not wanting to commit to something regular and then maybe you're letting people down. 
and I don't want to sound like I'm interviewing you, but I do have a question. <laughs> um, can you talk about, let's just be transparent. What is our life going to be throwing at us this fall that you can't commit? Well, like, well we what's both, going on with us? We both work full time. Our oldest is going to be in kindergarten. Our youngest will be um, at home being cared for by grandma. So basically every morning I'll be up and out the door and dropping the kids off and then right after school picking them up. And then you'll be working two nights a week as a professor. So Monday nights you usually have meetings at work at your full-time job. So Mondays you'll be home late. I'll make dinner. We'll get the kids all settled for the rest of the week. Then Tuesday you won't be home until after they're in bed. Then Wednesday I'll be working every Wednesday as an adjunct librarian at a local college. So we're both kind of working night jobs in addition to our full-time jobs. And then Thursday nights, you'll be working again as a professor teaching two courses. And then Friday, hopefully we all can take a deep breath and enjoy the weekend. So, and then weekends, really, I have a lot of uh, long runs planned. So I'll probably be out on the trails or out running for like an hour or two, maybe three hours um, this fall. And you know, we have a lot of activities. We're always doing stuff with the kids. So while I guess we sound like we're really busy, I don't feel like we're super busy people. It's things that are our choice. I wrote a whole blog post about being busy. Um, I don't like the word busy because we're choosing these things to spend our time with and do. But I love the fact that I can be home after school with the kids. And, you know, there's somebody here every day with them where after school, they're not you know, in aftercare or anything else. And not that there's anything wrong with that because people work different schedules. I have to, you know, miles will be in before care because I go to work early in a high school. So but I just love the fact that I can come home. We can go to the playground. I can make dinner. We can have kind of that normal family experience in the evenings. Twice a week, you won't be there for dinner. Once a week, I will I'll actually, well, I'll be there kind of for dinner because I leave a little bit later. But, you know, we can kind of have all of that. And on the weekends, we kind of, we're, we're pretty more, I think we're, a little bit more. Our weekends aren't as busy in the fall and winter. Summer, it's barbecue, barbecue, barbecue. Well, yeah, but we're off all summer, so that's fine. But I feel like we're very protective. That's the word I was thinking of. Very protective of our time. We don't like to fill our time with things that we don't necessarily want to do or places we don't want to go or spending time with people we don't, you know, that don't make us feel good. So I guess in the sense of, I believe I wrote a blog post on this too on katenessie.com about being frugal with your time in a in that busy post because I feel like the same way that you are frugal with money and you choose and you take control over that, I feel like we do kind of the same thing with our time. Like the fall is a crunch time. We kind of get things all geared up and we're, you know, on the move and on the go and busy all week, um, you know, at things or teaching or helping others. And then I feel like the weekends, it's like, well, do we want to go to that party that's two hours away? Do we want to go here? Do we want to go there? What do we want to do so that we can spend the most time with our kids and, and enrich their lives and, and things like that? So, yeah, we don't. And a lot of people don't seem to have a whole lot of events too much in the fall. And the holidays are, you know, always nice. And then after that, we're usually kind of hermits for the winter. <laughs> At least I am. And then, but yeah, summers were always, every weekend we're somewhere, there's, you know, somewhere we're expected to be or choose to go. So, but luckily we're home all summer, so we can, we have Monday to Friday to spend our time and, and have our days of boredom and our days of activity. So this all factors into how we need to set up our life and how you can set up the podcast to work for you. So it, it should work out in the end and people should be excited. Yeah, I, I definitely think I'll find more time. Um you know, the podcast is a, is important to me, but my running is a priority. So that's, you know, make sure I do that before I do anything else. Speaking of the running and the lifelong learning theme, share with the listener a little bit about the running method that you are employing now. Well, I am now probably, this is going to be another podcast episode <laughs> on my show at some point soon. Um, I have decided to focus on Jeff Galloway's run, walk, run with method. So before you go, eh, Walker, you're a jogger, you're not a runner. I have been a runner for 15 years. For uh, at least 10 of those years or more, I never walked on a run. I even ran a half marathon without stopping. Um, so I was always a runner. And I actually ended up with a lot of injuries. I had hip problems. There was a point actually after the half marathon I did 10 years ago where I went to the doctor and he said, you need to just stop running. I had knee problems. They were going to do MRIs. 
And I was like, oh my God, this is my sanity. You can't. And he was like, yeah, no, you just need to stop running. That's it. You're done. And and that was not going to work for you. <laughs> no, I did not accept that. So within the next year or two, I read a lot about, um, that's when like Born to Run came out, I believe in like 2009, 2008, somewhere around there, uh, which is a book about the time you're uh, in Mexico and they run barefoot hundreds of miles a day and whatnot. Um, I'll have Chris link to the book in the show notes. So, and you probably by now, it's been out for a long time. People have talked about it. Uh, I ran in those Vibram Five Fingers. And I had, actually, I, I wore those in the winter in the snow. I had... The little mittens for your feet. Yes. I actually, I had gotten them as a Christmas gift. My mom loves me so much that she buys me all the weird things I come up with. And I had two leather ones. And um, I I would run, literally, it'd be like snowing, two feet of snow. And I'd be out in my leather, Vibrams, no socks, nothing, just wearing those running. And I ran barefoot. Uh, I started out running completely barefoot. And I'll go more into that on my episode about all that whole process. But I actually learned how to have a better stride and a better gait and actually understood my body. So long story short, I did barefoot running. Then I switched slowly over to minimalist running because I did do like an 11 mile barefoot run. And I ended up with a little bit of tendonitis because I am not the fittest, you know, size person anyway. So that was after, after we had miles, I was overweight and I started back to long distance running and I injured, I ended up with tendonitis. So then I went to a doctor who put me in ankle braces on both feet and told me I needed orthotics, put me in orthotics and said I have to wear the most cushioned shoes and like all this stuff. And I tried to run in that like two or three times. And while I had no pain and it fixed my problems, I was like, this just smacks in the face of how my feet naturally should operate, especially from everything I learned from barefoot running. And when barefoot running took me from having knee injuries, MRIs, hip problems to I can run without a problem up to 10 miles, I was like, nah, I'm not wearing these things. I can't, I'm not. So then I decided to go back to running, but I went with now a lot of shoe companies make minimal shoes. So there's no heel drop, zero heel drop, which was important to me. So now I can run naturally with lightweight shoes. And then after I had crab or Colton, I guess I call him crab everywhere. But after I had Colton, I wanted to get back into running and it was very hard. Uh, it was much harder than it was the first time around. I had gained a lot of weight pregnancy wise and, you know, I was, I went back to work, you know, he was 11 weeks old. So it was just a lot. So I had stumbled upon the run, walk, run method. And I really liked it because it just, I was like, Oh, I'll use this first to start using it to get back up to full, you know, distance running without stopping. And then I really liked it because it like made my runs fun and it made them like easy. And I was able to run like six to 10 miles and not be tired. Like anytime I ran over five miles, like I'd come home and I'd have to lay down the rest of the day. So it kind of made running long on the weekend hard if we had a barbecue or something else to go to, or then, you know, just being home with, with miles or or Colton, it was like, Oh my God, I can't get off the couch. So, which is very hard when you have little kids (laughs) because you never sit down. (laughs) I think this is the longest we've sat all summer. So Anyway, I started with the run, walk, run, and it was really nice because even, like, I remember I finished a six-mile run, and I was like, I felt great the whole rest of the day. We went shopping. We walked around the mall. We went to the playground. Like, I was still completely active, and I was like, this is impossible, six miles, and I still can function. So, anyway, so this past summer, I decided again to, I tried to use a different fitness app, uh, Fitness 22. They're great apps, and I was like, you know what? I'm going to use this app, and I'm going to go from, you know, run, walk, run to you know, running straight. And I got all the way point of running, you know, up to about 15, 20 minutes, uh, nonstop again. And then I started to have knee problems and I was like, Oh no, like, no, this is, I, I want to wrong long. And the more I've learned about really where I want to get to in distance wise, people walk at those distances. So where I want to get to and the lengths that I want to get to in my life, there are walk breaks. People just don't talk about walk breaks. So, you know, and everybody promotes things. So anyway, I bought Jeff Galloway's books. I signed up for a running course with Jeff Galloway on his run, walk, run method. I've kind of decided to completely immerse myself in this method of running because I found that it works for me. I can still have a life. I can still have young kids and I know I can get faster as well as wrong run longer distances. So for me, the run, walk, run, like this is like been the greatest thing ever because it gives me permission to be like, Hey, listen, you know, I need a minute. I need a break. You know, I don't walk for any more than 30 seconds over the time that I've learned about the 
method. Um, he's changed some of his recommendations. So I just focus in on, you know, whatever my run portion, it's, it is what it is. And I modify the different amounts of time, depending on the distance I'm running or the amount of time I'm supposed to be out running. And then I only walk for 30 second breaks at a time. Cause I found if I walked for a minute, I kind of got, you know, you kind of slow down a little bit and then you're like, ah, I don't really want to run again. <laughs> so 30 seconds was kind of like the perfect, like get a minute. I can, you know, get 30 seconds, I can walk and then I can pick right back up and I, I feel refreshed. And I also found it improves my posture when I've done, like recently I did a five mile trail run. My posture was great. My back didn't hurt. Like my abs weren't like, there was nothing like awkward about it. It uh, helps me, you know, catch my breath. I can do fart like runs a lot with it, which is fun or temper runs. Like I can really push myself if I want to and enjoy it. And I have no like lactic acid buildup. I have no pain in my calves. I have no knee issues. Actually, when I started this plan, I was having knee problems and I was like, let me go back to it. And like within a week, I was still able to run and my knee problems were gone. So I just love it. I I don't know. I know, you know, I'm not a competitive runner. I'm not going to win a race. I'm not out to win my age group or anything like that. So I guess if I was a competitive runner, maybe I would push myself further, but I really want to be a lifelong runner. Lifelong is like, I look at everything as like down the line, how long can I sustain this? And I really want to be that person who's 95 you know, winning my age group because I'm the only one in it <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and enjoying running. There's actually a guy in the neighborhood who still runs. And I remember him running when I was a kid and, and he runs so slow and, and, and whatnot, but it's like, he's still out there running and I know he's got to be way up there in age. And it's like, you know, I look at him and I'm like, I want to be that guy. I want to be that lady who's like, you know, little kids in the neighborhood are like, Oh, I remember that lady running around. <laughs> <laughs> and I feel like people are starting to get to know me around here <laughs> with my and, running. And they should. Um, as you're sharing all about, the, you know, the, this running method, what, what's hitting me, because as I sit here today, I, I still have no interest in running, but that that's a story. You only listen to me when I'm on the podcast. <laughs> for another day. <laughs> I, I think what the big takeaway is, is you're interested in something, you learn more about it, and you're making that investment in yourself. So for me, it's, you know, it's the ed tech, it's the DIY, it's the woodworking. It's, you know, if I don't know how to do something, I'm going to YouTube. I'm, I'm going to find resources to see if I can acquire a new skill or a talent or an ability, and then I can act on it or use it. You, you have your interest, whether it's running the food, uh, stuff with the gluten and some of the allergies that we've picked up as, as you've changed some things in your life over the summer. And really, you've learned that you were killing yourself for like 35 years. <laughs> I know. It's been, it was a long time of probably damaging my body um, unknowingly. But yeah, that's, I mean, that's what I think of like with running. You know, I have learned so much. I, and really with learning things, it's learning what works for you and what's important to you and where you want to be. You know, like you said, you don't love running. I don't make you run. I don't say go run. You know, I mean, I'd love it if you did run, but that's fine. Somebody's got to stay home and watch the kids when I go run 10 miles. Right. But, but, but for everybody, you know, for, but you for find you who's something that you're interested in, whatever you're interested in, or if there's something you've always wanted to do, or you've been curious about, yeah, go read about it, find a video, you know, yeah. what do you have to lose? Yeah. The, and that's the thing with this method. I, I thought, you know, I kind of felt like, oh, it took me a little time to like, even admit it, like on Instagram, like, oh, I'm doing run, walk, run. Like I was like, oh, I'm so lame. But really, I'm not. And now I'm fully embracing it because I'm like, oh, this works so well for me. I can keep doing it. My mental state is great because I love running. And that's the way I kind of blow off steam and kind of organize everything going on. And you're going to achieve the same goals that another runner might have. You're just doing it differently. There's yeah, and there's, and there's so many different methods. There's Hal Higdon's methods, which I've used before. There's Hansen method. There's so many di different methods to either get faster, get longer, achieve your goals. There's coaches out there. So, and once I booked going to meet Jeff Galloway, I was like, oh, I'm all in, I'm all in. And like, you can run an under three hour marathon with his plan. I'm never going to get there. I don't think I'll ever sustain a seven minute mile pace, <laughs> but you know, it doesn't stopping to walk here or there doesn't mean that you're not a real runner. And it doesn't mean that you can't finish in good times. There's people who've done under a 20 minute 5k using run, walk, run. And it's, and you do. And what, again, what I love about it is you do what works for you. If you want to walk 30 seconds and run 30 seconds, you do that. If you want to run every mile and walk 30 seconds at the end of the mile, and that might take you seven or eight minutes, 
you do that. So his whole thing is set up for you do what works for you and how you want to do it. And in a race, I would probably change my run walk ratios or I would change, you know, I've even done runs where I felt so great and I'm like, oh, I'm going to skip these couple walks because I just feel awesome. So it's really what you want to do and what works for you. So as the young kids say, you do you, (laughs) you do you. And that's what lifelong learning is all about. It's about learning throughout life and focusing on what is important to you. So I hope things on my podcast might spark you to either learn about something new that you've never heard of. I'm sure the next episode, very few people have heard of. I'm not going to give you the topic right now, but episode number three is going to be an interesting one. A lot of people, anytime I've spoke about this, um, it's actually a food item. Anytime I've spoke about it, people are like, what is that? What are you talking about? But they don't forget it because it has a funny name. And a lot of times at other parties and barbecues this summer, they're like, wait, you don't eat this. You eat this, right? And I'm like, yes. So, and you know, not that anybody might cook with it or use what I do, but it might spark you in a new way to find something new to work with. Now, because we could talk here in the past to the people in the future, there may be people listening to this right now. Who, oh yeah, that can go who, back. Who episode three See, is already out. I'm still out. learning about podcasting. That's I okay. forget so, that part. So if you go check out the Lifelong Learning Podcast, while we record this, we're not going to give it away. But if you're listening to this and it's way past August of 2017, you're going to want to go to katenessie.com slash three to hear about this interesting food item. <laughs> uh, and, and then obviously, you know, click subscribe and and check out the Lifelong Learning Podcast. Now, before we move on, there's one other aspect of you being a podcaster that I wanted to ask you about. And in our conversations about you having this podcast, some of the episodes are going to be where you are monologuing, but there is also the potential and you have the desire to have guests on. Now, excluding myself in terms of interesting people who you'd like to have on, could you share maybe your dream one or two guests that you would love to have this person on and like I do here, you cheat. You you have them on so you can learn from them and you're going to share that conversation. So who would be like your number one and number two people that you would love to have on your podcast and get the chance to talk to? Oh, gosh. There's a lot of people I would love to talk to. Um, Right off the top of my mind, I would think Seth Godin. I feel like he's impressed a lot upon my life, my thoughts. I read his book, Lynchpin. Um in the second episode, I talk about our downtime financially in 2009, 2010, and I had read Lynchpin in 2010, and it just totally changed the way I looked at my work and looked at the way that that I performed my work. So I would love to like have a conversation with him. I think he's just such a unique person, and you know his his blog posts always seem to hit like a moment where I'm like, wait, how does he know that connects with my life? You know, so. Yeah, I think he would be probably like my number one person where I would love to interview him. I know somebody once like wrote him, sent him mail that was like a bouncy ball with like a request on it. And like that was something he paid attention to because I'm sure he gets millions of things. So I was always like, man, I just want to like mail him like some crazy thing and see what happens. So we'll see that that, you know, maybe in 10 years. (laughs) <laughs> I would well, love again, to uh, maybe in the future, if you go to Kate com, there might be that Seth Godin episode. We don't know right now, but yeah, I would just love to, I would love to talk to him and learn from him. And in the realm of frugal living, I would love to talk to Mr. Money Mustache. I just, I love his brashness in his blog and just his, you know, he's just very open and honest with his words and doesn't mince words. And I just, I love what agenda he's trying to push forward with getting people on their bikes and getting people out of their clown cars. And yeah, so I would, I would love to have a conversation with him at some point too, just to learn more about just his thoughts. And and real quick, what is Mr. Money Mustache? Mr. Money Mustache is a blog. So if you go to mrmoneymustache.com, he writes a blog he started years ago and it's all about frugal living finance. He, you know, he has a lot of money. Um, he retired very early in his life, but he still does not like, he doesn't live a lavish lifestyle. Like sure. He built himself a house from scratch himself. Like he did a lot of things, but in the grand scheme of things, he's, he's always focused on this kind of like, you know, don't be ridiculous. Don't spend more than you earn, you know, invest your money, save for the future, you know, do these kind of things like financial freedom is within reach, like get it done. And stop driving around your stupid car and ride your bike and walk places and do things that are, you know, live in a neighborhood where you can do that. So a lot of times when I read a lot of 
his blog posts or, or, um, you know, or he's been on various podcast episodes and things. I'm like, Oh, I got to get on my bike and go to the food store. So like every time, you know, I, I kind of immerse myself in that we haven't really rode our bikes to the food store that much this summer, but last summer, I think every week we rode our bike to the food store. So I kind of want to get back to, you know, getting really around. I rode my bike to work many times. Um, and when I can, I try to try to fit that in, but, but yeah, so I guess those two people would be really awesome. JD Roth from, um, get rich slowly. He inspired my whole frugal journey. So sometimes I, I would love to talk with him and, and kind of still, you know, learn more from him and, and his thoughts on things. And yeah, there's just, there's a lot of great people out there. There's a couple runners that I love now that have podcasts. So I feel like I'm getting to talk with them without really talking to them. <laughs> I, I I still think I mean one I'm still giddy and excited and and the sky's the limit and any guest that you want to get you're eventually going to get because that's just how your life seems to work so that's a a compliment and well I hope you're right <laughs> I, I I think I will be <laughs> I kind of chose this podcast too because there were so many different people I'd want to eventually talk to I didn't want to like be like hey come on this frugal podcast even though you're a runner and like right. maybe so aren't it's, frugal it's, like... again it's going to be you sharing your experiences and your learning and sharing your story that other people can learn from. And again, eventually that's going to include conversations that you're going to share. Yeah. I look forward to having other people on to have a conversation with. To, to wrap this up first, thank you for being here on this whole episode, which we're going to move forward with. But again, promo the podcast and how people can get in touch with you and how they can get connected with what you're doing now. It's the Lifelong Learning Podcast. You can find it wherever you listen to podcasts, iTunes, uh, we use Overcast, anywhere you listen to podcasts. You can be in touch with me. I am on Instagram currently at Kate Nessie. So you can find me on Instagram. That's where I'm posting my workouts. And like I always like to say, it's not about the kids. So it's mostly about my food and running and, and things in our life. And that's, and my blog, you can check out my blog, katenessie.com. Everything is there. The podcast episodes will show up there as well. That's where I write, um, a lot. I haven't wrote a whole lot this summer, but I plan to get back into it this fall. But yeah, so katenessie.com or pretty much on any media platform, I'm at Kate Nessie. So if you're curious if I'm somewhere, you can find me there and check out the Lifelong Learning Podcast. Awesome. And, and if you can't remember katenessie.com. You can go to chrisnessy.com, which is one more letter than Kate, and there'll be a link to everything, the podcast, her Instagram, all that stuff in the show notes for this episode over at chrisnessy.com slash 92. All right. And now it is time for this episode's House of Ed Tech. VIPs as I give Caitlin a break. So this episode's House of EdTech VIPs are stemming from an experience I just had where I was recently invited to run an intro to Twitter workshop at Marlboro High School in New Jersey, where my dad teaches. Uh, and my good friend Jeanette Bruno is a vice principal there. And I used to work with her when I was the public address announcer at Colts Neck High School. So I wanted to shout out the attendees as well as Jeanette as people who are looking to become more connected and showing an interest in creating their own opportunities for professional and personal growth as connected educators. So the following people are all people that are really getting into Twitter and people you should follow and connect with as appropriate, but you should really follow them all and say hello and tell them Mr. Nessie sent you. So of course, Jeanette Bruno, she's the vice principal at Marlboro High School. She is on Twitter at Jeanette Bruno. There will be a link to all of this in the show notes. Dr. Lavetta Ross, she's a VP at Manalapan High School, and her Twitter handle is at LSR underscore Dr. Mom. Amanda Harrison, high school English teacher from Manalapan. She is on Twitter at A-H-E-N-G teach, A-H English teacher. Jessica Martin, she's a first year math teacher at Marlboro High School. Her Twitter handle is at Martin underscore math the number 24. Chris Mara, another high school math teacher from Marlboro. His Twitter handle is Mr. Mara 816, and that's M-A-R-A 816. Sarah Rice, she's a high school Spanish teacher from Manalapan, and her Twitter handle is Miss Rice WL Teacher, 
and that's R-E-I-S-W-L teacher. And finally, Matthew Sauter. He is a high school English teacher from Marlboro High School, and his Twitter handle is Sauter, M-H-S, and that's S-A-U-T-E-R-M-H-S. Congratulations to all of you. Good luck in your journey on Twitter. I'm glad that I got the opportunity to talk to you and make sure that you are going to connect with all of these people and grow your PLN. Those are the House of Ed Tech VIPs. Nope, I played the wrong song, people. Let's try that again. Yeah, so this is the end of the episode. (laughs) Welcome back, Caitlin, to kind of close this out. Thank you so much for being on this episode of the House of Ed Tech. Thank you for inviting me. It wasn't that hard. We were able to easily coordinate this very special appearance. Yes, during nap time. (laughs) Um, I would love to connect with you and hear your thoughts about the information that Caitlin and I talked about in this episode and the resources that we shared. You can do that by going to chrisnessy.com slash 92. You can obviously connect with Kate. She is found at katenessy.com. We packed a lot of value into this episode. I hope so. I think we did. I think so. Now, because you got so much value out of this... You got a whole lot of the run, walk, run. Yes, that's. (laughs) I I, I might have to alter the title of the episode now, but I think it'll work out. Um, So with all the value that you got out of this, Kate and I would like you to do a couple of things. Number one, tell somebody else about the podcast. If you enjoy the House of Ed Tech, and of course, if you make it this far in the episode, you really have to enjoy the podcast. So share it on social media. Tell somebody you teach within your building about it. Uh, If you do it on social media, specifically Twitter, uh, use the hashtag House of Ed Tech and also tag the show on Twitter. The account for the show is at House of Ed Tech. The other thing you can do is you can become an awesome supporter of the podcast. Special thanks to Jen Giffen, Peggy George. Kate likes Peggy George. Yeah. (laughs) Dan Gallagher, Jeff Herb, and Brent Warner for being supporters of the podcast. If you're interested in contributing as little as a dollar an episode, and you don't have to, but it would be nice if you did, that, that'd be cool, uh, go to chrisnessy.com slash awesome. The next episode of the House of Ed Tech, number 93, we're getting there, we're getting close. Oh, wow. And I've already told Kate what I'm going to be doing for episode 100, so make sure you're tuned in and subscribed for the first Sunday in December of this year when episode 100 comes out. It's going to be a lot of fun. But episode 93 has to happen first, and that is going to be released on September 3rd, 2017. And I'm going to be speaking with a fan of the podcast and middle school English teacher, Krista Penrod, all the way from Wisconsin. So I'm looking forward to bringing you that conversation in a couple of weeks. Kate, any last words? Go check out my podcast, the Lifelong Learning Podcast. I would yes. love it if you'd listen and give me some feedback and let me know what you're learning about or anything you'd like to learn about. Maybe I have some information on it for you. I, I can't say anything more than that other than until next time, thank you for learning with me and Caitlin. And remember, using technology isn't difficult. Just give it a try. The House of Ed Tech is a proud member of the Education Podcast Network. The Education Podcast Network. Podcasts for educators. Podcasts by educators. For more, go to edupodcastnetwork.com. So I just wanted to quickly, at the end here, in this little post credit sequence, just share what Caitlin actually said to me when I first asked her if she would be on episode 92 of the podcast. I recorded her in secret, so she's going to hear what she said because she doesn't remember. Oh, hell no. (laughs) I sound a little bit like uh, Will Smith when I'm angry.